Good evening. Tonight, a chance to meet someone whose opinions are always influential, even if his face is seldom publicly seen. Mr. William Rees Mogg, the editor of The Times. Not surprising, there are one or two journalists here who want to meet them. They're among the people who want to question him in a moment. But the others range from a computer programmer to a student, so we're hoping for plenty of variety in the questions. But first, a look at William Rees Mogg and the career that brought him to Printing House Square. William Rees Mogg, aged 42, was born and bred in Somerset. He still lives there at weekends when he takes a break from the responsibilities he shoulders as editor of The Times, the only national institution in Britain which is also a national newspaper. On Sunday mornings, he attends Mass at the local Roman Catholic Church at Midsummer Norton with his wife and four children. William Rees Mogg was brought up in this house 12 miles from Bath. His father was a landowner and county councillor. Mrs. Rees Mogg was an Irish American actress before her marriage, and it was she who introduced Catholicism into the family. William followed his father to Charterhouse and then to Balliol College, Oxford, where he gained a second in history and became president of the Union. His contemporaries included Jeremy Thorpe, Robin Day, and Dick Taverne. His intention was to be a barrister, but in 1951 he accepted a job on the Financial Times. The 50s saw Rees Mogg establish himself as a journalist, but he was less successful in politics. Standing as a Conservative, he failed to win Chester Street, a safe Labour seat in County Durham. His political views were Liberal Conservative, the same brand of Conservatism held by Lord Boyle, who's also the godfather to his son. In 1960, he joined the Sunday Times and soon became their political and economic editor. In July 1965, he wrote a strongly worded article criticising Sir Alec Douglas Hume. Four days later, it is said, partly as a result of the article, the Prime Minister resigned. And just over a year later, the new owner of the Times, Lord Thompson, settled on William Rees Mogg as his new editor. He succeeded to a distinguished line. Men like Charles Russell, whose famous reports from the Crimean war front shattered the complacency of the Victorian War Office. And Geoffrey Dawson, whose pro-German editorial line during the 30s gave encouragement to Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. What has the Times been like with William Rees Mogg as editor? You keeping the Hong Kong? Or you... oh, yes, the Hong Kong will come back to page five. Without doubt, the paper is less of the tribal notice board it once was. As Rees Mogg once said, I want the Times to be the paper for people with A levels. Within three years, the circulation increased by 80%, gaining many new readers amongst the young and professional classes. On Sundays, the Times looks after itself. The editor is far from Printing House Square. After church, the family returns to Stone Eastern Park, their beautiful country home. Here, William Rees Mogg enjoys weekends with his family, his mother, daughters Charlotte and Emma, sons Thomas and Jacob, and his wife Gillian, who was his secretary on the Sunday Times. A man devoted to his family and to his religion, a man who also holds one of the most important and influential jobs in Britain today. Yours is a very important and a very influential job. I suppose many people seeing that small profile of you would have got the opinion that you were rather remote from the mainstream of life, spending the majority of the week in Printing House Square and the rest in that enormous, gorgeous, beautiful mansion in Somerset. Well, I think going to Somerset is a very sensible thing to do because the problem of editing a metropolitan newspaper is not just to do it from a metropolitan point of view. And people in Somerset seem to me to be a great deal saner than people in most other parts of the country. So that uh, in Somerset I managed to get away from this, as you say, rather narrow world in London. But do you actually meet people in Somerset? Oh yes, I meet people in Somerset and uh, I meet a lot of people and there's a flow of ideas in Somerset which Londoners don't always know about. They're not all Londoners in front of you who want to meet you tonight, I hasten to tell you. <laughs> From Kent, first of all, comes Mrs. Rogers. Mrs. Rogers. Um, what did you want to do when you were a boy? 
Well, I think what always fascinated me was the problem of public affairs. I read history when I was up at Oxford, and I read history mainly when I was at school. And what excited me about history was this interplay of events and policies and personalities, uh, which is the life of public affairs. And uh, I always saw that uh, it was this area of work that I should like to be involved in. Thank you. Um, having been born with, if I may say so, a silver spoon in your mouth and with a, a very secure background, um, did this have any effect on you when you had to make decisions about um, your possible career? Yes, I think I always knew that I was very fortunate that I had got this secure background and had opportunities of education and so on. I was brought up, uh, North Somerset isn't thought of as an industrial area, but in fact, of course, uh, there's quite a lot of industry, and there was, and still to a small extent is, a mining industry. And when I was a child, uh, one was, I was quite conscious of the effects of the slump on the mining industry and of the poverty. And uh, we took a certain amount of part in local politics. My father was being elected to the county council, like canvassed. Um, and uh, I was aware, I think, that there were very great problems which, if they weren't solved nationally, uh, couldn't be solved by individuals for themselves. Um, I, I gather that when you were at the university, um, it is true to say that you had almost made up your mind that you were going to be a barrister. Well, yes, I'd always thought I was going to be a barrister without actually having an immense amount of enthusiasm for being one. But would it be true to say that you became a journalist by accident? By pure accident. Uh, I was president of the union. They wrote an article about me which said that I read the Financial Times in bed every morning over <laughs> breakfast, which was true. And that was sent to the Financial Times in their press cuttings. And they thought it so odd that an undergraduate should be reading them over his marmalade uh, that they offered me a job. I thought it so odd they should offer me a job that I took it, and that was how I became a journalist. But don't you think it is odd to read the Financial Times in bed before <laughs> breakfast? It certainly would stri strike me as odd even now. Well, it's a very good newspaper. I uh, enjoyed reading it then, I enjoy reading it now, and I enjoyed working on it. Ah. Well, now, sir, could I ask you, um, what has attracted you? Um, to um, uh, have your journalistic career and such a large part of it um, with the Financial Times and the Sunday Times? Well, I was interested uh, in <coughs> both the problems of economics. I've never been a trained economist, and uh, uh, my economics are essentially those of somebody who is looking at it from the point of view of the determination of public policy rather than somebody who is a specialist in the subject. But I was fascinated by the problems of the relationship between economics and political decision. Uh, always extremely interested in these problems, which of course since the war have been the dominant problems in English politics. And I wrote mainly political leaders for the Financial Times. I was their chief leader writer for some years, and that was mainly concentrating on the political side of it. I was also writing about other and more purely economic subjects. And when I went to the Sunday Times, I started off as city editor, which was also an economic financial job. And then I had on the Sunday Times this rather strange title of political and economic editor, which actually reflected much more my special interests than it uh, did any normal <coughs> pattern of employment in journalism. Can we have one quick question from the back from Deborah Davis there? Mm. Part of the entry for the scheme run by the National Council for the Training of Journalists involves writing a 500-word essay on the subject, Why I Want to Be a Journalist. What would you have written when you first went into journalism? A quick praise here, yes. what you would have written. <laughs> uh, I think I'd have said that uh, I wanted to be a journalist because uh, I enjoyed writing, which was true, that I had a very considerable curiosity, which I think is the essential quality in a journalist, wanting to find out facts and always being absorbed in the process of finding out facts and that I had got already this uh, involvement in the whole area which I've been describing, the interest in public affairs, and I always wanted to deal with that part of journalism. If an applicant wrote that now, would you give him a job? <laughs> uh, well, unfortunately, the Times isn't allowed to be a training paper, 
so that uh, I wouldn't be in a position to if he hadn't got any previous experience. I suppose the answer is uh, that I would have a fellow feeling for him. Well, here's someone with a fellow feeling for you, uh, Mr. Reginald Holm, who is uh, a journalist. Why did you uh, choose to be a Roman Catholic? Uh, well, I was born one, and uh, um, never, in thinking about religion, uh, had reason to cease to be one. And how do you um, uh, find your faith uh, affects you in your work in a, in a positive way? I mean, what influence does it have in your editorship? I think that it's very difficult. Uh, and there used to be things, uh, and I suppose that there are still to some extent, which could be called specifically Roman Catholic problems. Uh, and uh, they do occasionally come up. But uh, uh, they certainly don't play a significant part. I think that what is much more important is that the Times is deeply bedded in its tradition uh, on the uh, English Christian tradition. And it was a paper which established these ideas of um, impartiality and fairness and independence and so on, arising really out of the Protestantism of the Church of England in the 19th century. And I find that uh, the uh, values which I have as a Catholic um, are, in fact, uh, capable of being identified with, uh, with the values that exist in the tradition of the time, so there isn't the conflict between them uh, that might be supposed to exist, that they are, for all practical purposes nowadays, identical, whatever they might have been 50 years ago. Do you find any conflict between your professional duty to be objective and um, your duty to be an obedient son of the church, if you are an obedient son of the church? Well, I think the whole idea of obedient son of the church has changed since the council, uh, that the emphasis on uh, conscience uh, is obviously very much greater. The atmosphere of the Catholic Church in which I grew up uh, was a highly authoritarian atmosphere. And um, uh, it was too authoritarian, I think, for the modern world, and that was why the council happened and why the church changed. I, myself, have been wholly in sympathy with that change and um, uh, always have thought for myself uh, and uh, therefore uh, when it became something which one was enjoined to do rather than something which was perhaps a little suspect, um, I naturally welcomed that development. Do you feel that uh, as journalists we get too preoccupied with the negative, especially as Christian journalists, should be searching somewhere for solutions as well as problems and getting, you might say, faith, hope, and charity in the headlines. Give a balanced picture. Um, no, I'm not sure. I think that journalism is concerned with exceptions, uh, that uh, uh, you are bound to study news by finding out what is the exception to what was expected, uh, rather than by describing the continued flow of things which happen as they are expected to do. And I think, therefore, that to that extent, it's inevitable that the occupation should, to some extent, be a negative one. On the other hand, I think that a good newspaper does have in it some very positive values. That I'm sure that this is uh, true of the Times, and I think it's true of all newspapers, um, that have an element uh, beyond the ordinary in them, uh, that there is a feeling for the good potential in society uh, which does come out in one's pages, or which one hopes comes out in one's pages. And many journalists get uh, coated over their idealism with a great layer of cynicism, seeing the wrong motives and the follies of mankind. Uh, do you find your, your Christian faith gives you a protection against that, or what effect does it have on, on, on such cynicism? I don't find, I'm not sure it's true of journalists, I certainly don't find that I have the least tendency to be cynical. Indeed, all my experience has rather led me the other way, uh, that um, uh, the more one sees of 
men in the difficult positions of responsibility which uh, I'm usually having to deal with. Um, the more I get impressed by the good intentions they have, by their desire to do good, um, I can't think that um, I can remember a senior minister in this country whom I wouldn't regard as being basically benevolent in his intentions towards the country and, to and towards his fellow citizens. Um, and I think that I'm moved by the virtue of human character far more than made cynical by its faults. Now, some people, seeing you sometimes at institute functions, I used to think um, you were a bit diffident and perhaps withdrawn. Uh, do you find you prefer print to people? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I combine being shy with enjoying public occasions, and uh, I've always found, as I think many people do, that uh, there's a certain sort of diffidence uh, uh, which one has. I notice it in a lot of politicians, uh, which uh, makes them temporarily shy, and there's a sort of skin of shyness. And then on another occasion, and I must admit that uh, if I had to address an Albert Hall rally, I should enjoy it very much. And um, uh, if one has a public occasion, then it draws out of oneself, and uh, this shyness disappears. So I don't find the, this sort of contrast a strain. What other public occasion would you enjoy? You would enjoy addressing a whole mob in the Albert Hall, but what other public occasion do you positively enjoy? Uh, I think public argument, I and mean, the one thing I miss about not being a barrister is that I think it would have been absolutely fascinating to argue a case in court. Somebody once said that if men had nine lives like cats, that everyone would want to spend one life as a barrister. And uh, I, I certainly feel that. Um, and uh, public argument, public debate is extremely enjoyable. But don't you feel that you've really got that in your hands as the editor of the Times? Yes, I don't feel deprived. Uh, but uh, oh, I was going uh, to suggest uh, that perhaps you were feeling no, deprived. No, no. I, 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 but I, it is the truth that I combine, which is the, the point. Uh, certainly, I regard myself as being a fairly shy man, uh, with uh, greatly enjoying public. Peter Taylor comes from Birmingham. Mr. Taylor, could you say, Mr. Rees-Mogg, what, in your view, are the basic? functions of the leader columns of the Times? To try and analyse, to try and get the issues clear, and to try and persuade people after the issues are clear that they ought to uh, take courses which we think are the right ones, to put up arguments with which they can disagree. This, I think, is tremendously important. Uh, a newspaper can afford to be wrong because it's not given to any of us to be infallible. Uh, it can afford to be wrong, that's say, in argument about its facts. It should always be as accurate as it can conceivably be. But if in argument it advocates a policy which is in fact a mistaken one, then the answer to that is that people should not accept it. But what is essential is that you should have this process of public discussion by which, stage by stage, you move towards a clearer public understanding of what the issues are and how they ought to be faced. That, I think, is the, the real function of the leader columns. Yes. To what extent, in fact, do Times leaders reflect your own personal opinions? They reflect uh, my own personal opinions when I'm specifically dealing with the subject. Uh, perhaps more or less absolutely, I may have written the leader myself. They also reflect the collective opinion of the paper, and they reflect very much, subject by subject, the uh, expert knowledge of the particular expert. Even if I was writing a leader myself, I would uh, have very much in mind the collective knowledge that the paper could bring to it, and normally uh, a leader would be written by the expert on the subject, uh, that can't be an invariable rule, rather than by somebody else. But by and large the expert's verdicts on the particular subject under, uh, under discussion would in fact have been previously endorsed by you as editor, presumably? Well, there's a discussion, there's a, we, we work together. I mean, not just yes. me uh, and individuals, but collectively we work together. Could you say um, also, in fact, um, whether you feel that on occasions you have, in any sense, personally influenced a higher level decision, say, in government or industry, through an editorial in the Times? I suppose that uh, I find it difficult to put a finger on a, a particular occasion when a particular editorial has had this effect. I think the cumulative effect of attitudes which the Times take up it, it can be very substantial. 
uh, and uh, there are movements of public policy and movements in our leaders which you can show work in a parallel way so there was an argument going on between the two uh, you don't get this sort of like playing a billiard shot that you put a particular ball into a particular pocket you advance the process of argument over a period of time yes um, <coughs> excuse me um, are there in occasions, in fact, when, um, uh, as editor of the Times, you feel that you have to override subordinates on particular issues, M matters of, 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 uh, that they presumably take um, considerable, uh, matters that presumably they value very highly, uh, and uh, you have to say, no, uh, you know, this is my view on this particular subject, and so on? Yes, I have to take the ultimate responsibility for everything that appears in the paper. And if my view is that wider considerations than the considerations which a particular expert has tell the other way, yes. I don't have to hesitate to make the decision. We live very much in the, in the era of the, um, the expert journalist, um, a, a breed of reporter uh, that's very highly opinionated. Do you feel, in fact, that the traditional distinction between comment and fact uh, is being blurred in any sense? I think this is very difficult. New York Times has a much stricter rule than we do, and I don't think the New York Times rule really works particularly well. I think that you get a false idea if you eliminate all the adjectives from what people write, that therefore the thing is wholly unbiased. In fact, bias can be created by the selection of news just as much as by the way in which it's written. What one has to do, I think, is to try genuinely to get impartiality into the bones of all the people working on the paper. It's a very difficult thing to do because none of us are terribly impartial ourselves. I mean, it's a matter of self-discipline as well as a matter of the, the discipline which other people bring to themselves. Can we just take two quick questions in the back? Michael Atwell. To what extent are you as editor um, limited by the Times' precarious financial position? The uh, management of the paper, uh, I mean, this would have come down to Lord Thompson, have been extremely generous to the editorial, and uh, we have been given um, very substantial sums with which to conduct the editorial of the Times. Does that mean you're not constricted? Uh, I mean that, uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, basically I'm not constricted, yeah. Um, if they did not I continue to be, to be so generous... About it, if they did not continue to be so generous, um, would you envisage lowering your journalistic standards or lowering the quality of the paper in order to boost circulation? No, I think that would be an extremely silly way of going about it, uh, because I think that if one lowered the quality of the paper, it wouldn't boost circulation. It would theoretically be possible to turn out a Times which moved rapidly in a popular direction and lost its authority. Uh, such a paper would be a failure commercially as well as editorially. Mrs. McClatter. Um, I have read the Times ever since I was able to read a long time ago, but I feel that you, that the Times is now a newspaper for the middle-aged. If I'm right in thinking this, uh, do you feel that you can um, bridge the generation gap and appeal more to younger people? Well, uh, I can only give a statistical answer to this, that 50% uh, of the readers of the Times are under 35, which is the largest proportion of readers under 35 of any daily or Sunday newspaper in Britain. So that obviously we do in fact succeed in writing for um, the younger age group. And uh, I think the answer to this is that uh, there is an illusion that the young don't want a serious newspaper. Whereas in fact, my suspicion is uh, that uh, it's the middle-aged who don't want a serious newspaper, that if one's producing a, a newspaper which is avowedly serious, which is really giving them the news, which is giving them the facts about the situation, and giving a good deal of background as well, and really serious analysis and comment, that it is uh, the man who uh, is two or three years from retirement and going home tired from the office, or coming fairly tired to the office in the morning, uh, who feels perhaps he'd like rather lighter fare, and it's uh, the young graduate who's really cutting his first bite into life who wants a paper of that kind. It's almost persuaded me to cancel my coffee for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Paul Tinian. Um, during the um, 50s and the early 60s, you tried quite hard to get into Parliament. 
Um, does this indicate that you, are, you were dissatisfied with journalism at that time? Uh, no. Uh, I was, um, as I said, uh, very much absorbed by public affairs as such. I thought I had a contribution to make to the discussion of public affairs. And uh, during my 20s and early 30s, I ran journalism and uh, politics more or less together. And uh, I waited to see uh, at which I would prove better. And obviously, I proved better at journalism than I did at politics. And that made the decision for me. I see. I wonder if you see any differences, or saw at the time when you decided, in fact, to stay with journalism, whether you saw any differences between the role of the politician and of the journalist that made you prefer journalism? Uh, journalism has some enormous advantages. Uh, it's got uh, the greatest of all blessings, I think, which is independence and that you're completely free, you don't have any party discipline, you don't have any reason to say anything which you don't believe to be completely true, and you say it for yourself. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, politics is concerned with the actual matter of power and the actual ability to change things. And journalism doesn't have that. You have an influence. You can't directly say that things will be done, and it is done. And uh, therefore, if one is uh, drawn towards the study of public affairs, one does see, I think, inevitably that there are advantages and disadvantages in both, uh, both things. Uh, what happened was that journalism, while I was on the Sunday Times, was becoming so interesting and going so well from my point of view, and I had such opportunities to do the kind of work I wanted that I didn't have any motive to uh, say in politics, and it just dropped away. Goodness. Can I ask Mr. Van <coughs> Do you think that the ever-increasing uh, visual aids and the complete change, the social changes, uh, that newspapers and books, indeed, will survive in the future? That the technology of communication is changing, you mean, by this? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, I think that uh, the advantage of being able to refer to something, to read it, uh, is so great that uh, newspapers will certainly survive. Chris Owen. You've been seen as one of the great advocates of, of modernization adapting to new technology, and yet you display an appreciation of traditional values, whether it's uh, adapting to the, to the traditionalism of the times or reading your daily paper over breakfast with marmalade and toast in bed in the morning, every morning. How can you reconcile the two? Uh, I think that there's no point in our changing our society uh, unless we are able to change it in such a way that its existing virtues are preserved. Now, undoubtedly, it seems to me that there is a loss in the historic process as well as a gain, uh, that there are many ways in, in which um, uh, this country is a worse place than it was in 1900, many ways in which it's a worse place than it was in 1800, that one can't prevent there being loss as well as gain in the development of history. On the other hand, if one just sits back on the historic process and says, I can't bear the future. The future has such painful things in store for me that I shan't deal with it or try to cope with it. Then I think that you not only lose the possibilities of the future, but at the same time, you lose the values of the past even faster. You become a stagnant society. Can you bear the possibilities of the future? Shortly after your son Thomas, who's now four, was born, you wrote a letter uh, to my newborn son. This was an article that appeared in the Sunday Times when you were with the Sunday Times, where you said, Europe is apparently going the way of America, America is going the way of California, and California is going the way of the devil and Mr. Reagan. Yes, uh, well, California has gone on in that direction, and uh, Mr. Reagan's still there. Um, but. Um, not necessarily wholly responsible for it. It's uh, a very pessimistic view, though, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I mean, the, obviously it's this thing. We live in this society, which is a mass society with mass technology, in which one can see in the Soviet Union the mass state. And the mass state of the Soviet Union, or the advanced technological state of the West Coast of America, seems to me equally inhuman and dehumanizing. And, uh, and this is where I think one comes back to religious feeling, uh, it seems to me that both tend to crush God out. 
And you get in the Soviet Union an avowedly atheist mass state with anti-religious propaganda. You get in the west coast of the United States, which I actually have never been to, so perhaps I'm just taking it as, a, as an example. I may have a fantastic picture of what it's like. But you, you, you get these cults springing up because people so deeply feel the loss of spiritual truth in the lives that they're leading. And if these are the two contrasts, which we're offered as the two ways in which we could lead our lives, and obviously both of them need to be rejected. And one needs to find a way of carrying through, of developing, so that we are not left adrift in the future, so we're not out of touch with the future, so that we can use the opportunities, but at the same time maintain both the traditional values, which I believe are vital to social development. I believe without traditional values, society starts to fall, fall apart but also so that people can have a spiritual life, a life with God, which I think is the essential point of the whole thing. If we don't manage that, we come to the end. You as a Catholic must have thought very carefully about your attitude to death. How do you, how uh, do you deal with that? Well, I'm very happy about it. Uh, and I do think that probably the next world is a better one than this one. Uh, and uh, my view of God, um, is that he's our father, that he is an extremely friendly God. And it seems to me that when it comes, provided one's been able to have a, a useful life in some way and hasn't got some great crime on one's conscience, uh, that it does come as a release and that one goes out, opens the door and walks into the garden. So that it's not a matter which worries me at all. And very briefly, can I ask you what maxims do you present for a useful life? How should man on this earth best order, manage, run his life? Well, I think that um, they should accept their duty and love their neighbours and love their God. There was one very quick question that wanted to come from the back. Very quickly, because we've got a few seconds left. I wanted to make a plea, Mr. rees mogg for the appearance again of the fourth leader. This uh, article was unique and lent a distinctive uh, touch to the times, and I'm quite sure that it gave pleasure to a great many thousands all over the world. Will you get your sense yeah. of humour back? It was a tradition founded by the great Lord Northcliffe, but uh, people no longer enjoy writing them, and if people don't enjoy writing them, I'm afraid people don't enjoy reading them. I'm with him. I enjoyed reading them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old and traditionalist and conservative like you. Mr. rees <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Our thanks to, to everyone who came along to meet him. Next week, our guest will be Cardinal John Heenan, the head of the Roman Catholic Church in England and Wales. I'm afraid that it's too late now to send questions for him, but in the following two weeks, we'll be inviting onto the programme Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, the Secretary of State for Education and Science, and Lord George Brown, who needs no further description from me or from anybody else. If you'd like to meet either of them about the